Uh, we have a 100 person limit on this Zoom room. So all of you who have made it, consider yourself very prudent in coming. Uh, this is Dare Nister. Dare Nister is a project between myself and Henry Hollander, who is a uh, a bookseller, a, a Yiddish bookseller, the first person in the world to sell uh, Yiddish books online. Uh, and we moved this whole operation to downtown LA, which you see uh, before you. And uh, part of what we do here is we feature a different speaker on every other every. Sunday or so uh, to yeah. talk about something that particularly interests them. Um, um, and what I'm trying to do now is just make sure enough people are muted so that there's no feedback. Um, and we've had before uh, episodes on uh, the one I presented on Solomon even Gavirol on uh, religious traditions around the world and how they compare with themselves. But now I'm very excited to have uh, my good friend Josh Kogan here, who I've known for quite a while. Uh, we used to just talk to each other in Yiddish when nobody was looking. Uh, we talked about Mexico and the beauty of Mexican Jews. And it turned out that after I got to know him for long enough that he, in fact, had done quite a bit of work learning about the history of Mexican Jews. And his work, uh, the story of the Jews of Mexico, uh, has been a work in progress for quite some time. And as I've gotten to know his work and what he's been up to, I realized there's been quite a bit of of work behind it. And so the fact that he can join us and present something just truly amazing and truly beautiful with us is, is just a complete joy to me that, that this is possible. I mean, a big part of what we're trying to do at their Nister is bring out, uh, bring out voices that are, have yet to be heard, have yet to be heard. And, and I think Josh is one that will be heard uh, quite a bit after this little uh, introduction. So with that, I'm going to um, make sure if you come into the room, I'm going to make sure to mute you if you are overlapping uh, sounds. And then I'm what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, actually, let me uh, put the presentation that Josh so thoughtfully prepared into uh, it's full glory on my screen, and then share that. Um, and wait, hold on. And wait, hold on. Okay. And well, all right. I guess I'll share this, and I'll turn this into the full screen. Come on, work. Uh, there we go. Okay. So Josh, if you'd like to explain, uh, where did this, uh, work come from? How did you come up with this book? What did you, what made you decide to do this? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Zach and Henry and Danny and everyone at their Nister. I've been looking forward to this day and I'm so excited and so grateful that you invited me to speak. I am a very big fan of the Niste, and it is such an honor and pleasure to be with you. Uh, so thank you so much. And I also like to thank my parents, my brothers, my grandparents, and every one of you that, that is here today with me for your support, for your time. Thank you so, so much. So to, to answer your question, Zach, I believe it'll be fitting for me to quote one of my favorite actresses of all time, Julie Andrews, and say, let's start at the very beginning. A very... Okay, are we good? Hola. I think you're on mute, Zach. Yeah, this is going too fast. There's so many of you here. <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead. Keep going. Okay. So back in 2017, I was a student at Kent State University, majoring in Jewish studies and history. And one of the requirements for the students in this program that I was in 
was to write a thesis incorporating your two areas of study. And so it was very easy for me to decide what to write about. I didn't have to think about it too much. I thought, you know, I'll write the story of the Jews in Mexico. And so in the summer of 2017, I traveled to Mexico City where I was born and raised. And I did a lot of research. I was able to collect thousands of pictures, sure. hundreds of documents and dozens of books that I, brought, that, that I brought back with me here to the US. And of course I had to pay for um, two overweight suitcases at the airport. Uh, and well, look, luckily for me, my great aunt, my grandmother's sister, Alice Gohman de Bacal, who is here with us today, uh, she's an extraordinary historian and she agreed to be my thesis advisor. And I'm so, so grateful for her wisdom and her advice. And so I came back and I started writing. And I also had another advisor at Kent State. And there was a point when I had already written about the colonial period and the 19th century. And I was beginning to write about modern times. I, I think I was, I was writing about the year 1912. And my advisor said to me, you know what? I I think it's I think we're with what you have. It's mm -hmm. more than enough. Just wrap it up and turn it in. You're good. And so I did. I, my thesis covered the history of the Jews in Mexico from the colonial period until 1912. I turned it in and I graduated. And then I thought, wait a minute. I, I put so much effort and time into writing this. I don't think I can just let it get lost in the archives of Kent State University. So I, I need to continue writing, finish the story and share it with the world especially with the Jewish community of Mexico, because this is the one story we all share, regardless of our origins. It doesn't matter if some come from Eastern Europe and some come from the Ottoman Empire or the Middle East or Northern Africa. It doesn't matter. We all share this one story. So I continued to write that summer and I was able to write the story that covers a period from 1912 to 1950. Then I moved to LA, I came back home the next summer and I continued writing from 1950 up to, well, back then it was 2019. Right. And the book was originally written in English. And so it took me another year to translate into Spanish. And that's what we have now. We have an English version and a Spanish version that are yet to be published, but I will make sure personally to let each and every one of you know when the physical copies are available, please God soon. <laughs> no, thank thank you, and thank you for bringing this. This is, feels like it's a world premiere of of such a a, a beautiful work. Um, so just to give everyone a bit of uh, some some ground rules, make sure that you're on mute for as much of the time as possible. Uh, we'll be theoretically taking questions towards the end as we get through the presentation. Uh, this is being recorded. It'll be available as a a podcast later on uh, for all of you. The story of the Jews in Mexico. Uh, with, with each other. Um, and yes. And let me go find where uh, I might be. Yeah, I think that that's about it. Um, ah, okay. Found. Um, and <clears throat> so, uh, yes, I was just looking through a lot of different people. You managed to have filled my whole Zoom room, Josh, uh, <laughs> pretty much. Um, okay. So, but this presentation is going to go on for, let's say, about an hour and a half, maybe up to two hours. So just mm -hmm. be aware that uh, this will be a very full and thorough presentation of Jew Mexican Jewish history. So let's move on to the next slide. What we see here from my recollection of speaking with you is, um, is a really iconic photo of Mexican Judaism, of Mexican Jewry to be specific. It's a family dressed in pretty much Eastern European clothing on the very famous canals of Xochimilco in Mexico City, uh, covered in a banner that says Bienvenidos. So the most Mexican of things with the most Jewish, Eastern European Jewish of people. But I'm told you have a personal connection with this photo. Yeah, so the people in this picture happen to be my family. Uh, I believe the picture was taken maybe around 1949 or 1950. 
And we see uh, at the bottom right, the little girl is my, my book advisor, the one I was telling you about, my great aunt Ali. And to her left, the, the second girl is my Bobe, my, my grandma, who is also here with us today. Then to her left, it's their, that's her third sister, Etele. And so it, it's my whole family here. And I just love this picture. And it's a very, I've, it's a very beautiful and iconic picture because it represents uh, not only your work, but also you. It's like all put together uh, in, in, so you can see the personal interest that you have in it, uh, as long with the, the eye for, for history that you have, that you, that you added into it. So let's look, move on to the next slide over here. Um, so here we have a map of Mexico, and I thought that it would be very important to situate a lot of people who might not be so familiar with Mexico as a country and what it looks like uh, with what it is and what exactly we're talking about. So over here, you know, to the north, we have the United States to the very far uh, up, upper left hand corner. We have Los Angeles, where I'm situated um, and. And over to the south of Central America, but in the middle we have Mexico. If you can see specifically in the middle, uh, right in the thinnest place between the two, that's Ciudad de Mexico. That's Mexico City, right in the middle. But what cities did you have in mind are particularly important to talk about in in, in the the history of Mexican Jews? Great. So we're going to be focusing on Mexico City, which is a big circle in the middle. We're also going to be talking about Veracruz, which is on on the East Coast, uh, the closest point to Mexico City. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Monterrey, which is at the north, and Guadalajara, which is right underneath where it says Mexico. The and Zoom section about the Jews of Mexico. Mainly, our focus will be Mexico City. Oh, this is no, and this is excellent. Um, so that that helps us situate us uh, here. One thing I wanted to say is, OK, now we have an, a sense of space, but now we need to have a sense of time. When we were talking about how we were going to present the history of Mexico, we had a couple of different options. We could do it thematically like some historians do it. They might say, let's talk about social history and then let's talk about it in, in political history. But. I think, uh, as, as you decided, and I think rightfully so, that the best way to talk about Mexico is chronologically. And the biggest reason was, was not only did Mexico change dramatically, but the Jewish populations involved also changed dramatically, depending on the period of time. And so we have, uh, we have a few divisions. Do you want to talk about uh, which sure. division you decided on? So there are three main periods in Mexican Jewish history. We're going to talk about the colonial period. Then we're going to talk about the 19th century, which involves the liberal reform and the porfiriato. And then we're going to talk about the last period, which is modern times. So as you said, we're going to talk about these three periods chronologically. Now, this presentation will be more of an overview of the story of the Jews in Mexico. There are a lot of events, foundations, and institutions that, although they're very, very important, they had to be left out of the presentation because if we would have included every single detail, event, organization, and person of the Mexican Jewish community, we'd be sitting in this Zoom meeting until December the 21st and <laughs> nobody wants that. So if you'd like to read about every detail and event of this story, you'll have to get the book. And I would love to sign it for you. <laughs> okay, so I think we're ready, Zach, to jump back in time. What do you think? I think that's the exact right move to make. Um, and as we go on, we're going to see, a, I just want to point this out to everyone, we're going to see a presentation with absolutely beautiful pictures and beautiful documents of history. And so those will prompt our questions, I think. Those will prompt us of where we're going. So uh, next, what we have, let me just read the chat. Really, Yes, okay. Uh, next, oh, come on, there we go. Next, we have what, what seems to be the colonial period and uh, a portrait on one side of what appears to be a Spanish th throne room, and on the other side, a picture of a few old boats. You wanna, so where do we begin in our journey of Mexican Jewish history? Okay, so our, we're gonna start with our first period, the colonial period, and our story begins in 1478 in a far off land called Spain. In 1478, 
the Spanish Inquisition was established in Spain. And the Inquisition was an office set up within the Catholic Church, whose purpose was to root out and punish heresy. The Inquisition was infamous for its tortures, really horrible tortures, uh, which we'll see a, a couple of pictures of. And also they were known for its persecution of Jews and Muslims as well. So from in Spain, from 1478 until 1492, the Jews were able to lead somewhat of a normal life. Not really normal, but somewhat of a normal life. The nightmare for them really began in 1492. So in 1492, as we see on the picture on the left, Ferdinand II of Aragon and his wife, Isabella I of Castile, the king and queen of Spain, they expelled all Jews from Spanish territory. And so when they expelled them, the Jews had three options. Number one, leave the country as Jews. Number two, stay in Spain and convert to the Catholic faith. And number three, stay in Spain as Jews and be killed by the Inquisition. So around 300,000 Jews left Spain in 1492 and they scattered throughout Northern Africa, the Ottoman Empire, the Balkans and Western Europe. And all those, we don't have a number, but those who decided to stay in Spain converted to the Catholic faith. Some truthfully, and they really forgot about their Jewish past, but most of them were only Catholic in public spaces and during the day. At home, hidden from the world, in darkness, they continued to be Jewish. So we have six different ways in which these Jews are called. So we, they're called, the first term is marranos, which is a horrible term that means swine or pigs. We have conversos, which means converts. We have new Christians. We have Judaizers. We have anusim, which is in Hebrew, and it means forced, because they were forced to convert. And the last term we have is crypto-Jews, which means Jews in hiding. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be using the term crypto-Jews. So 1492, very big year for Spain. All Jews are expelled, and Spain discovers the American continent. So 86 of these crypto-Jews traveled with Christopher Columbus to the New World. And very quickly after that, settling in the, world, settling in the New World be, as far away as possible from the Inquisition became a vision many crypto-Jews shared. And so very, very soon, the two largest communities of crypto Jews in the, in the New World became Recife in Brazil and Santa Cruz de la Sierra in Bolivia. Then in 1519, a man called Hernán Cortés sailed to the New World. And a minor portion of his men were crypto Jews, many of whom were uh, blacksmiths, and they uh, even aided in the construction of his caravels. And just to name a, to name a few of them, because we do have the names, uh, some of them were Hernando Alonso, Santiago de Carvajal, and Alonso de Avila, just three names. And so in 1519, Hernán Cortés conquered Mexico. So when he first arrived to what is modern-day Mexico, this 1519 marked the very first presence of Jews in the country ever. So after, after that, in 1521, he conquered Mexico City. And in the following decades, very small crypto Jewish communities could be found in cities such as Veracruz, Puebla, Oaxaca, Guanajuato, Querétaro, Pachuca, and Zacatecas. So I think we can go on to the next slide, Zach. Yes. Um, trying to get there. There we are. Uh, yes, here we are. And and pictured here we have um, a, what appears to be a medical school, but I know that's not what it started as. And something quite uh, difficult to see, which is uh, some sort of, of older... Uh, Quiet. Oops. There we go. 
Um, we've got, uh, yes, indeed, a difficult torture um, going on. Um, but tell us what this was about. What happened here? Okay, so in 1571, guess who boarded one of these ships in Spain and sailed across the Atlantic to Mexico? The Inquisition. So in 1571, the Inquisition was established in Mexico. A really horrible bad news for, for all the crypto Jews in, in Mexico. And so what we see on the left, that is the palace of the Inquisition in Mexico City. Wow. It still stands. It was the headquarters of the Inquisition. And many years after the Inquisition was abolished, the building became the National School of Medicine. Uh, so just as an interesting fact, my grandfather studied to be a doctor and he studied in this building. So just imagine, you know, him sitting in a classroom studying anatomy where, it, it, you know, it's the same room that probably we see on the right where Jews, crypto Jews were tortured. I mean, really, yeah, fascinating stories. And so at the bottom, we see some of the records of the Mexican Inquisition. It says uh, on, the, on the first line, it says Manuel de Lucena. It's from at the, at the top, it says 1594. And at the bottom, if you see underline, it says Judaizante, which means Judaizer. Mm -hmm. That was his crime to be Jewish. So, wow. and on the right, we see, of course, some of the, of the horrible tortures they, they used to do. So, so even though the Spanish Inquisition gave reason for Mex for Jews to run away to Mexico, they couldn't really escape Spain over here. Exactly. So let's look at the next slide over here. And here we have really just um, the tortures uh, portrayed very directly with chains, and with wheels, and uh, with uh, other dastardly inventions. Yeah, so um, we, I have three. There are many, many stories that I would love to share, but I'm going to share three specific stories that we have from Crypto Juice. So the very first story I want to tell you about is from a man called Luis de Carvajal El Mozo. El Mozo, El Mozo means the younger because he had an uncle whose name was also Luis de Carvajal, but we're gonna focus on El Mozo. So he was a crypto Jew in Mexico and after his entire family was persecuted, tortured as we see on these pictures and imprisoned. And as we see at the, at the top, some of the handcuffs from an inquisition prison well, his entire family was imprisoned. And after, after that, for a while, he was freed from prison, Luis. And so when he was freed from prison, he really embraced his Jewish identity and he encouraged other crypto Jews to do as well. He even performed a circumcision on himself, on himself as an act of faithfulness to Judaism. And then under the pseudonym Joseph Lumbroso, he wrote a memoir, which we see at the bottom right corner. And in this mm -hmm. memoir or diary, he wrote about how he learned that he was Jewish from his father. And he also included a set of prayers. Uh, he included the Ten Commandments and also the 13 principles of, of the Jewish faith by Maimonides. And so I have here, uh, I have... Uh, I wanna to read to you how the memoir begins. And he writes, saved from terrible dangers by the Lord, I, Yosef Lumbroso of the Hebrew nation and of the pilgrims to the West Indies in appreciation to the mercies received from the hands of the highest, address myself to all who believe in the Holy of Holies and who hope for great mercies. Wow. So that's what we see at the bottom right corner. Wow. And sadly, Luis de Carvajal El Mozo, after being found guilty of still maintaining the Jewish tradition alive, he was burned at the stake in 1596. Hmm. Uh, we have another story about another crypto Jew whose name was Sebastián Rodríguez. So in, in 1596, Sebastián Rodríguez was imprisoned by the Inquisition, again, for Judaizing, for being Jewish. And this is, I just find this fascinating because in prison, Sebastian didn't consume the meat he was served. Wow. He refused to sweep his cell floor on Saturdays, which is Shabbat. 
He washed his hands before eating bread. He prayed every day towards the east with his head covered. I mean, this is really fascinating. And so the, the his story goes that in 1603, the Count of Monterrey decided to honor a captain named Esteban Lemos for, because he, he did, this captain did an exceptional labor in the palace of the Inquisition. So Sebastian Rodriguez, the crypto Jewish prisoner, he was very mindful and, and he knew that the holiday of Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, would be, you know, around the time of this honor. So he volunteered to assist in the planning of, the, of this honor for Lemos. And surprisingly, the inquisitors let him assist. And, huh. and so we, he requested a lot of branches. And he decorated the open air in the Palace of the Inquisition. There's this sort of open air central patio. And so he placed the branches over the four, over the four walls of the patio. So for the special occasion, he designated chicken to be had as a meal. And he verified that the chickens were slaughtered ritually according to Jewish law. So on September 21st, 1603, Sebastian with his wife and other crypto Jewish prisoners, they were able to celebrate Sukkot under the noses of the inquisitor. So they feasted under a hidden sukkah in plain sight. I mean, how amazing is that? That's a, I, I would have never have thought to hear a story like that. It's, it's amazing. So they, they were very lucky, the Rodriguez family. In 1606, they were set free. But their very, very miraculous fate was not a common destiny for crypto Jewish families at all. Uh, they were exceptionally lucky. And because most crypto Jewish families were imprisoned for life or tortured and burned at the stake. So they were very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. And one last story that I would like to share with you is the story of a couple and uh, the name of this couple is Simón Baez Sevilla and Juana Enríquez. So most families in Mexico have, have always had domestic servants. Uh, and during the colonial period, these servants would often turn in the crypto Jewish families they worked for to the Inquisition because they would be very highly rewarded. So, mm -hmm. so the crypto Jews had to be very, very careful about their hidden Judaism, even inside their homes. So there's this great story about Simon and Juana, who uh, the, right before Yom Kippur, they started fighting horribly. Like really, they, they, they were yelling at each other and they were screaming. And so on Yom Kippur, they told their servants to not prepare any meals because they were too angry to eat. That's brilliant. <laughs> Just brilliant. So I think we can go on to the next slide. So what we see here are some very odd looking Judaica artifacts that seem like normal artifacts, but there's something off about them. Yeah, so, um, so after 1649, the crypto Jewish community of, well, it was in New Spain, but today uh, let's call it Mexico. Uh, this community started to disappear. So the Inquisition had persecuted, tortured, imprisoned, exiled, or killed most crypto Jewish families in the country. And those who remained had already assimilated and were true Catholics. Their only, Zach, their, this is amazing because their only link to their crypto Jewish past was Jewish ritual objects, such as the one we see on the slide. So they, they didn't know what these objects were, they, or what they were used for, but they kept them. So we see on the left a grager, which, we, which is used on Purim. And this one is a, a, a very small grager, but it's from the colonial era. And I, I don't know, just like the little girl at the top, I find it really beautiful and fascinating. And on the right, we see a menorah, which was probably used as an ornament for on, on a wall or we're not, we're not sure, but these, they kept these objects and they, you know, they passed them down from generation to generation. 
in... the, Gro- the Grogger looks is is exceptional because yeah, you're right. There is a little girl on top of the Grogger, and she's dressed in this very, very like 1500s era dress, and right. it's this beautiful silver, and it's like a beautiful household object. And if you were to connect it to being a poor noisemaker, it'd be kind of hard to put them together. But that's exactly what it is. Right. So after this community of crypto Jews started to disappear, the Inquisition was then limited to persecuting drunk men, witches, and those accused of blasphemy. Now, before we move on to the second period of Jewish history in Mexico, I would just like to mention what happened during the second half of the colonial period and how it came to an end, even though it doesn't involve any Jewish history at all. So in 1810, we have the independence of Mexico from Spain. Uh, Miguel Hidalgo y, Cast- y Costilla. <laughs> Oops. Uh, uh, sorry, Josh. Um, no, we- oh, dang it, I did it again. Uh, sorry, it's very hard. To, there we go. To, to things move fast. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in 1810, we have Miguel Hidalgo, a Catholic priest. Uh, he rang the bells of his church in the town of Dolores on September 16th, 1810. And he implored his congregants to rise up against the very uh, repressive Spanish colonial system. And he gathered thousands of followers and mobilized them in a series of armed revolts. And so these became known as the Mexican War of Independence, and it ended until 1821. In 1820, the Inquisition was abolished in Mexico. And 14 years after that, in 1834, the Inquisition was abolished in Spain. So Which is where really we- late. Most people, most people <laughs> when they think of the Inquisition, they think, well, that's from the 1500s or the 1400s, but exactly. it took a little while. Right. So, so where are we now? We have a brand new country called Mexico that has been born out of the ashes left by the Spanish. And so it is time to clean it up. So let's go on to the next slide. So let's define where the liberal reform is. That's after Mexico's declared independent and during the time in the 19th century. Is that right? Right. Right. So as you said, this second period takes place in the 19th century. Now, the, the first half of this period doesn't involve a lot of Jewish history in the country, but it, but it is very, very important for us to talk about. And I'll explain why with this metaphor. Okay, so let's, all, let, let's imagine a street, okay? The street represents Mexico as experienced by Jews. This street goes through three stages, an unpaved street, then there's the paving process of the street, and finally we have the paved and beautiful stone street. So the the unpaved street represents the colonial period. The street is full of dirt, mud, it is filthy, uneven, unbalanced, and it is definitely not safe for Jews or anyone to drive through. Then for the paving process, which represents the 19th century, the street has been closed. It is under construction. There are workers operating everywhere. There is noise, there are construction trucks. It's difficult to get close to that. So finally, we have the paved street, which represents modern times. So the street is clean, smooth, it's even balanced and it is very safe for people to drive through. And that's why I really like this metaphor uh, is because you have these extreme periods where you go from Mexican Jews in the beginning who had to hide because even the Inquisition followed them there. And then suddenly in the 20th century, as we're going to see later, they're living in a certain amount of prosperity and happiness and assimilation and all those sorts of things. And you wonder what happened in the middle that made that possible, right? How does this even make any sense? And that's where we are right now. So if, if the second period doesn't involve a lot of Jewish history, so why do we have to talk about it? Right? So we have to, we, we have to talk about it because we have to understand who decided to pave the street, why they decided to pave the street 
and how they paved the street. In other words, why did the Jews find a safe haven in Mexico in modern times? What happened before that made the country so special? Right. So on the left, we, we have a picture of Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez was the 26th president of Mexico. And he did a lot of wonderful things for the country. He is considered by many to be the greatest president in Mexico's history. Uh, and he did a series of reform laws. So for example, in 1855, he published a law called the Juarez Law. And this law abolished military and clerical privileges. And then two years after that, he published the federal constitution of the United States, of the United Mexican States, excuse me. And this constitution included uh, a bill of rights and it, it also limited the power of the church. After that, Benito Juarez also nationalized all church property and cemeteries. And he also, uh, he put birth and marriage registrations under the civil authority. And finally, and very, I think most importantly, he separated the church from the state. And so he guaranteed religious liberty to all Mexican citizens. And these, these reform laws really opened the doors to all Jews from around the world. Not many took advantage of this, but there is a record from 1861 of a very small group of Jews worshiping worshiping publicly in, in Mexico City. I think the, the record says that they, this group of Jews rented a, a room or some, some sort of space in a building to pray on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Wow. That, so that, that, that's incredible. I didn't realize that when we were gonna talk about the liberal reform that like it was, it was truly a, a monumental uh, shift in Mexican society that even allowed for this to happen. Um, and over here, we, we see a lot of buildings and gatherings of people. It, what, uh, how could we describe what we're seeing in the rest of the slide? So these two pictures, I just really like because it's uh, just the way the Mexico City looked during mm -hmm. the liberal reform. So we see the beautiful, you know, colonial buildings and the people in horses, and we see all sorts of animals. I just love these pictures it looks like a society that's evolving a little bit from where from exactly. where it was before let's look at the next slide which is uh an even grander uh version of these things right and so there there was a very important incident that we have to mention during the presidency of benito juarez and that is the conquest of mexico by the french and the establishment of a monarchy so from 1864 until 1867, the emperor of Mexico was Maximilian and the empress was his wife, Carlota. And they, they upheld Juarez's reforms and they even broadened religious freedom in the Mexican empire. And just as an interesting fact, the personal physician of emperor Maximilian was Jewish. He was a Jew wow. from Austria and his name was Samuel Siegfried Karl Bombach. So I, I find that fascinating. And then, well, in 1867, the Mexican empire collapsed. Maximilian was killed. Carlota went back to Europe. For and, which we were familiar with uh, Cinco de Mayo. That's, that's what that <laughs> came to be, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And uh, in there, the, we also have a record in 1867 only about 20 Jewish families lived in Mexico, although there was no social life, no community life, nothing. Um, and well, Benito Juarez continued to be the president of Mexico until he died in office in 1872. So let's, so yeah, in, in front of us, we see, uh, I believe Plaza La, La Reforma or the Zocalo. Zocalo is the- El Zocalo, the, yeah. This is the Zocalo. Yeah. So the center, of the city in that time. Um, and uh, this is a, an appropriate place to move on to the Porfiriato, if I'm not mistaken. It, it's perfect. So, <laughs> so let's talk about the Porfiriato. On the left, um, we see a picture of Porfirio Diaz. Now, Porfirio Diaz is, was and still is a very, very controversial president. On the one hand, 
he was a dictator. He established a strong centralized state that he held under very firm control for more than three decades. And so this long period is what we know as the Porfiriato. He, Porfirio Diaz destroyed local and regional leadership and even the legislature was composed of his friends. So he maintained tight control over the courts and he, he also exploited the, the poor, the lower class. But on the other hand, he modernized the country. And that will be our focus now on, on this presentation, the modernization of, of Mexico. So Porfirio Diaz felt that the key to modernizing the country was to invite foreigners to invest in it. And among these investors that he invited, many of them were very wealthy Jews from France, Belgium, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. These Jews felt that Mexico was the open door to enlarge their businesses. That's all they, they cared about. And so even though they didn't immigrate permanently and like they, they didn't establish a Jewish community life in the country, they are still an important part of Jewish history in Mexico because of the role they played in the mo modernization of the country. So, so let's talk about some of the ways in which Mexico was modernized during the Porfiriato. Uh, we have public electricity, we have automobiles like we see at the bottom left, we have paved streets, we have the expansion of railroad and telegraph networks. Um, they also introduced new art trends like uh, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and Romanticism. Uh, during this time, formal music became very popular. Mm. So styles such as uh, waltzes and operas and operettas, they were very much listened to at this time. And another big thing that, that, that they did was to bring and to found department stores in, in Mexico. So we have this, the picture we see on the right bottom corner is El Palacio de Hierro, which is a department, let's say it's like the Macy's of Mexico or the Nordstrom. And so El Palacio de Hierro was founded in 1891 by the men we see a picture of on the top right corner. And this man who founded El Palacio de Hierro was a Jew from France. His name was Joseph Tron. And so he, based on, on the department store called Au Bon Marché of Paris, he founded El Palacio de Hierro. And uh, what else did they do? The, I think we can go on to the next slide. I think we have more pictures. Yeah, and, and by the way, one thing I, I wanted to comment on when I was, I was looking at those is that essentially there was like a wholesale import of European technology and culture straight, straight from Europe, which is why it was really convenient exactly. to have those foreign investors. <laughs> right. So we, here we see another thing during this phase of mo modernization. We see a lot of new buildings. Most of them, uh, the architecture of the building was inspired by the French. So we have at the bottom left, we have the Palace of the Fine Arts, El Palacio de Bellas Artes, uh, very, very famous and really beautiful. And also the Postal Palace, which we don't have a picture of, but it's a very beautiful building that was built at this time. And we also have banks uh, that were being established in Mexico. So for example, uh, at the top, we see the picture of a Jew from Switzerland whose name was Eduard Nötzlin. And Eduard Nötzlin founded Mexico's National, ba National Bank in 1884. Uh, and what else? We have, so on the right side of the screen, we have a very famous jewelry store called La Esmeralda. And La Esmeralda was founded in 1890 by two Jews from France, whose names were Hauser and Sidi. And they used to sell, you know, all sorts of, you know, the finest artistries and jewels and watches and music boxes and a lot of uh, European um, things and jewels. So despite their interest, the, the interest of these Jews in Mexico's economic opportunities during the Porfiriato, 
most investors return to their countries of origin during the first decade of the 20th century. So the Jews that lived in Mexico City at the turn of the century didn't identify themselves with each other. And so a, a Jewish community didn't exist at all. They were assimilated Jews and nationality was the most important aspect of their identities. And just to mention it, in, in 1910, a uh, revolt under the leadership of Francisco y Madero uh, forced Porfirio Diaz to resign. And this was known as the Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. Madero was declared president. Diaz went into exile to Paris, of course, a city he admired and loved. And he died in 1915. So what do we have now? We have a highly modernized country with a very, very solid foundation on tolerance, acceptance, and religious liberty, which brings us to our third period of Jewish history in Mexico. And, and so we move from this uh, modernization period to, uh, I guess you could say, a, a really modern times. Um, and you're, you're going from a point where the free market is embraced and the best of Jewish talent is brought in and then they leave. Um, but then with this booming economy that I presume you get through modernization, it makes sense that right now a <laughs> lot of workers would come in from abroad to fill in those gaps in the, in the workforce and that um, these people might actually share the very same ethnicity of those, of those capitalists who built the whole society. And you're moving from a, a form of art and, and focus of this upper class that built it to, as you can see, these more realistic images that became a staple of Yiddish literature and, and actually literature of that period. So it's a right. pretty dramatic shift in not only what happens, but even how it's even talked about. Right. So this third period covers the 20th century and, the, and part of the 21st century. And the Jews we will talk about that arrived at the beginning of the 20th century founded the Jewish community of today. Uh, these Jews immigrated with the intention of staying permanently in the country and establishing a strong Jewish community. So let's talk about some of the causes of emigration. Where do these Jews come from and why, they, why, why did they leave their native countries? So... The Jews of Mexico have four different origins. We have Eastern Europe and they, they're called Ashkenazi Jews. We have Spain, Northern Africa, the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire and, and they're called Sephardi Jews. We have Damascus in Syria and they're called Shami Jews. And finally we have Aleppo in also Syria and they're called Halevi Jews. So let's talk about Ashkenazi Jews. After 1881, when the Tsar then of the Tsar of Russia was Alexander II, he was assassinated. And after his assassination, a massive wave of pogroms spread throughout the Russian Empire. And a pogrom is a, a very horrible, violent attack on Jews and on Jewish towns, which includes ransacking homes, businesses, synagogues, beatings, rapings, and killing. Uh, and so because of these pogroms, and also because of economic reasons, Ashkenazi Jews in search of religious freedom and economic opportunities started to emigrate from Eastern Europe. And the most popular, popular destination among them, as we see on the picture on the left, was the United States, because they saw the United States as the golden land, as we see, you know, shiny, beautiful, the land of dreams. So then let's talk about Sephardi, Shami, and Halevi Jews. So after the Young Turk Revolution of 1908, a series of programs and new laws spread around the Ottoman Empire, which promoted the, like the, the modernization of the empire and a new spirit of Turkish patriotism. This involved obligatory assistance to state schools. Also, the, they had to use Turkish as a national language and they had to join the military, which is something that 
the Jews of the Ottoman Empire really didn't like. And so they were not happy with this. And besides this revolution, the economic situation was on the floor. So Sephardi, Shami, and Halevi Jews started to emigrate as well. And they found refuge in Latin American countries, such as Mexico. And when all these Jews were emigrating, um, and most, as I said, most Ashkenazi Jews were coming to the United States, in 1921 and 1924, we have new U.S. immigration laws. So these two, uh, these two federal laws limited immigration, and they had an enormous impact on the Jews from Eastern Europe. Because, you know, these Jews could no longer immigrate to the golden land, the land of their dreams. So many of them, you know, what, 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 can, what can they do? So many of them sailed back to Europe. Uh, some decided to go back and establish their own country. Uh, and some of them settled in Latin American countries. Now, many decided to immigrate to the physically closest countries to the United States. And so in the 1920s, we see a very large number of Ashkenazi Jews settling in Mexico. So here we see uh, at, at, at the bottom right corner, we see a picture of the port of Veracruz, uh, which is on the coast of the Atlantic. And the port of Veracruz is where most of these Jews, not all, but most of these Jews uh, disembarked there, just as the Jews in the United States disembarked on Ellis Island, that's like the equivalent. And so we have the port of Veracruz and the little uh, documents you see spread out on the, on the slide are just some documents uh, of, you know, immigration papers that I was able to scan uh, when, when I was doing research at the Jewish Documentation Center of Mexico. Which is incredible to see, really, to, to see that, that history right in front of you like that. Uh, is now a good time to let's see what's on the next slide over here. This looks like what life became when those Jews came to Mexico. Right. So as soon as they disembarked in Veracruz, most of these Jews, the vast majority of them, traveled directly to Mexico City. And in Mexico City, um, they started to congregate in this neighborhood called the Historic Center, which was you know, ar around uh, an area called La Merced, La Lagunilla, around the streets of Jesus Maria, Justo Sierra, Loreto, Academia, and Soledad, among others. And this whole area became known as the Jewish Quarter. So very similar to the Lower East Side in New York City. And these immigrants, worked selling merchandise, I don't know, like uh, ties, handkerchiefs, socks, knives, uh, shaving razors. They started to sell all of these things in the streets and markets of Mexico City. Now, besides Mexico City, Jews also traveled from Veracruz to cities such as Monterrey and Guadalajara, and they founded their own communities there. But we're going to focus today on the Jews of Mexico City. And we see pictures here of the historic center around the time, these pictures were taken around the time when, when these Jews started to, to congregate there. And at the bottom right corner, we see a typical vecindad is what it's called. Uh, and most of these Jews that were you know poor and they lived in vecindades, which is this, this sort of, packed courtyard, you know, with many l super small apartments, which would be, I don't know, I guess the equivalent would be like the tenements in New York City. So in Mexico, we have vecindades. Which, I, you know, it, it, when I saw those for the first time, it reminded me a lot of the sort of packed, dense housing that you might see in Boyle Heights here in Los Angeles, the uh, where where a lot of people could live together, but your quality of life might not be so high. But you you're not living in these huge uh, buildings like you would in New York, but you kind of have a a very similar experience. Right, right. So 
should we go on to the next slide? Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the establishment of the four different Jewish communities in Mexico. So in 1912, the first Jewish community was established by all Jews, regardless of their origins. Shami, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and Halevi Jews founded this community and named it Sociedad de Beneficencia Alianza Monte Sinai, which means the Mount Sinai Charitable Society Alliance, but we're going to call it Monte Sinai because the name is too long. And the building we see on the left is the first synagogue of this community, and it was built, at, as we see at the top of the building, in 1923. Now, after 10 years of trying very hard to work together as one single community, this happened. It was the holiday of Purim in 1922. And the Ashkenazi Jews entered the synagogue, not the one we see on the left. It was a, another, a different building. They entered the, this building to pray very early in the morning and they started reading the Megillah, the scroll of Esther, according to the Ashkenazi ritual. So after a while, Sephardi and Syrian Jews entered the synagogue. And when they saw that, they started yelling at them, screaming, you know, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do that. And so the Ashkenazi Jews took the scroll, left, and they finished reading it in a different room. After Purim, they said, you know what? It's time for us to establish our own Ashkenazi community. And so they did. They separated themselves and they founded their own Ashkenazi community and they named it Nidhei Israel, which means the rejected people of Israel. And because they named it that because that's how they felt. They felt rejected from Eastern Europe and once in Mexico, they also felt rejected from the rest of the community. So the, the building we see on the right is the first Ashkenazi synagogue and it was built in 1941. So I think we can go on to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so one, one year after Nidhe Israel was founded, the Sephardi members of the Monte Sinai decided to do the same. So they founded their own Sephardi community in 1923, and they named it La Fraternidad, which means the fraternity. And the building we see on the left is the first Sephardi synagogue, and it was built in 1942. So Monte Sinai was left to be the community of all Syrian Jews, Shami and Halevi. But in 1938, the Halevi Jews realized their differences with the Shami Jews were greater than their similarities. And so they too separated themselves and created their own Halevi community, which they called Rotfei Tzedek, which means pursuers of justice. And the building we see on the right is the first Halevi synagogue, which was built in 1932, even before their community had been officially established. So, I know it, this sounds a little bit confusing, you know, Monte Sinai, Ashkenazi, 1922, 1938, Aleppo, Sephardi, So to quote Julie Andrews once again, oh, let's see if I can make it easier. So on this slide, what do we have? We have, this is what we have in 1938, four different divided Jewish communities based on their origins. We have one community of those who come from Damascus, one of those who come from Eastern Europe, one of those who come from the Ottoman Empire, and one of those who come from Aleppo. Now, after Rodfei Tzedek was founded in 1938, the leaders of the four communities thought, you know, this is not right. Uh, we should probably establish an institution that will unite us all, like a, like a governing body, let's say, and so on November 9th, 1938, they founded the Comité Central Israelita de Mexico, 
the Jewish Central Committee of Mexico. And that date might sound very familiar to some of you. While in Mexico City, the governing body of the Jewish community was being born, back in Germany, Jewish businesses and synagogues were being ransacked and burned in, in what became known as Kristallnacht. And so that happened on the very same night, November 9th, 1938. So they founded the Jewish Central Committee of Mexico, one governing body. Uh, the, this committee re re represents, st it still represents the entire community before the Mexican government. And most importantly, it fights against anti-Semitism. And uh, so each of the four communities established its own cemetery, their own synagogues, their own uh, Jewish day schools. And just to mention it, some of the communities have changed their names in modern times. Nidhe Israel is now called La Keile, which means the community with a Yiddish pronunciation. La Fraternidad, is now called La Comunidad Sefaradi, which means the Sephardi community. And Rod Feit Tzedek is now called Magen David, which means the Shield of David. So I think we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so these are- So we have, it seems like we have, like just as you were talking, <laughs> like it's important that you were mentioning uh, Kristallnacht coming at the same time as the founding of the Central Committee of Mexican Jews, because at the very same period of persecution and and difficulty in Europe, uh, a whole all those who decided to come to the New World seem to be quite well rewarded here in Mexico. So and and you see that by all these different celebrations going on here. So what 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 are these celebrations of, and how do they happen? Right, so we have these pictures were taken during the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, these are just some simches, you know, weddings or bar mitzvot. And it, it's, I, I just lo really love these pictures. I, I, I love looking at every single face and the clothing and the floors, the walls. And I just find them truly fascinating. And we can see on the picture on the left uh, at the top, if, and that's a wedding. And if you take a close look at the wall, there is a portrait of Sholem Aleichem, the Yiddish writer. I, I don't know, I, I just love these, these pictures so much. And so this was a time, you know, where when businesses started prospering. And so the all of these immigrant Jews started moving from the vecindades in the historic center to houses in newer neighborhoods like Condesa, Alamos, Roma, and Polanco. And it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned the Sholem Aleichem portrait. Didn't the school you go to, was that named after Sholem Aleichem, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, not the one I went to. Uh -huh. There is another school that was named after Itzhok Leibush Peretz, but, but, not, but it's not the one that I, was, that I went to. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, I, it, it rung a bell. I wasn't sure if it was the right one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's the one that I have all the <clears throat> for for the il parrots oh oh there yeah henry says that he has your the the parrots school yearbooks which is exciting <laughs> but speaking of written literature um and okay. and other <laughs> events of the jewish community what do we have here okay so this was a special request from you zach That's right. and even though i'm allergic to sports it is very very important for us to talk about them especially about one institution in particular. So at the top left corner, we see a picture of Maccabi. Maccabi was during the 1930s, 20s and 30s, a Jewish sports association that was a part of the Young Men's Hebrew Association. In the 1940s, some of the members of Maccabi proposed the idea of building their own athletics institution which they thought would be fundamental, you know, for, for the progress of the Jewish community. And so we have at the bottom left corner, a picture of a newspaper in Yiddish. <clears throat> and it says, Dos is der Projekt von Yiddishen Sport Center in Mexico. This is the project of the Jewish Sports Center in Mexico. 
and we have like a painting or drawing of what it would look like. And at the bottom of the newspaper, we have a list of all the names of people that, that had at that point donated money. <laughs> And an appeal for more people to donate more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so in 1950, we have the Centro Deportivo Israelita, the Jewish Sports Center. And it was, um, you know, as we see on the picture, these are just two of the pictures taken in, in 1950 when it was first uh, founded. And it was such a joy for most Jews and everyone used to go and spend a lot of time there. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see what it has become. Wow. This, this is the CDI. And this is not only an athletics institution today. There are athletics, of course. We have, you know, basketball courts and football and soccer and baseball, and tennis, racquetball. But we also have swimming pools, we, we used to have bowling, we have gymnastics, there are dancing lessons, art classes, theater workshops, there's a restaurant, there's a library. It, so it's more of a cultural center. And the, it, the thing that makes it so special is that the CDI is a place for all Mexican Jews. So the institution very soon became what is, you know, perhaps considered to be the most important establishment in the country. And although it was initially founded by Ashkenazi Jews, the CDI is now open to members of the four communities, which is something I really admire and love. And, you know, this this is really interesting to me because, um, you know, my colleague Natan Freller from Brazil, he would describe how the most central focal meeting place for all the Jews who might be divided in one community or another in Sao Paulo would also be a massive athletic center. It seems as though the JCC movement in America and these, these sort of mass uh, athletic centers were the vehicle to bring unity to the Jewish community, no matter where. Exactly. exactly. So let's go to the next slide. Whoa, I do love the look of Yiddish newsprint. <laughs> okay, so languages and media and the press have always played a very important role in the history of Jews in Mexico. Sephardi Jews spoke Ladino, Syrian Jews spoke Arabic, and Ashkenazi Jews spoke Yiddish. All of them, of course, spoke also Hebrew and Spanish as well. So each community started creating their own press. So at the top of the slide, we see three different Yiddish newspapers. So we have the Stime, we have Mexicaner Leben, we have the Zeit, but these are just three examples. We, there were, Zach, so many different Yiddish newspapers published in Mexico. Oh. We, there, there was like Der Beg, Yiddish Stim, Unser Stim, Yiddische Tribune, Mexicaner Bochem, that so many different ones. And at the bottom of the slide, we see three different newspapers in Spanish. The one on the left belongs to the Monte Sinai community. Uh, the one in the middle belongs to the Magen David community. And the one on the right, which is called Kesher, belongs to all communities. So these are just a couple of examples of, of, but there are plenty of magazines and, and newspapers. Oh. All right, let's look at this one. This one is really interesting because it, it kind of goes back to that first photo we were talking about with the intersection between Jews dressed in European, Eastern European clothing, your family, and <laughs> very much Mexico. But this is like the day after picture where Everyone right. started to become comfortable dressing like Mexicans. Right. Immigrants loved going to Mexican places like Xochimilco, like we see at the, at, the, at the top in the middle, or Chapultepec, like we see on the corner, at the bottom left corner. And so they loved going to these very Mexican-looking places to have themselves photographed 
so that they would be able to send these pictures back to Europe and to the Middle East to show their relatives how happy and settled they were in their new country. They also used to, you know, put on this very Mexican looking clothing and have pictures taken of themselves. And so, so, so something that characterizes the Jewish community from other Jewish communities is that most Mexican Jews identify as Jewish first and then Mexican. So there is not a lot of assimilation. So we can go on uh, to the next delicious oh, slide. Oh my, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I'm so excited. These are just some examples of dishes that show the mixture of Mexican culture with Jewish culture. So on the left and at the bottom in the middle, we have gefilte fish a la veracruzana. So uh, there's a Mexican dish called pescado a la veracruzana, which is fish, any type of fish in a tomato sauce with olives and chilies. So when the Jews saw and, you know, they tasted that dish, they were like, okay, so we can just take out the fish and put in gefilte fish. And so they did. And that was what we see on those pictures. And it is the most delicious thing in the world. Oh and at the bottom right, we have a picture of Jewish guacamole. So instead of, you know, your regular Mexican guacamole, which has fresh onion and cilantro and lime and tomatoes, the Jews have, you know, the avocados with a lot of fried onions and hard boiled eggs. And that makes it Jewish guacamole. And again, it is the most delicious thing you'll ever try. Oh, and God. at the top of the screen, we have, a, I don't know, it, it, it's a matzo ball soup with pozole. I have never had that before, but apparently someone has. <laughs> and I, so I cannot tell you if that's good or not, but I found the picture and, you know, it's just, it represents Jews and Mexico, so I, I put it there. Now, before we go on to the next slide, here's the most frequently asked question about the Jews of Mexico. How many Jews are there in Mexico? <laughs> and, and the answer always varies. You know, some people say 80,000, some say 60,000, some say, you know what, no, there are 35,000, some say 45,000. So Let's go on to the next slide. All right, let's find out. Okay. According to the 2018 United States Department of State Census, there are 67,000 Jews in Mexico today. And at this moment, I believe it'll be fitting for me, Zach, to quote Julie Andrews one last time Please. and say, so long, farewell, avides and good night. I hate to go and leave this pretty site. Thank you so much for having me, Zach. It has been a pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for being here and for your support and for your time. From my heart to yours, I thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, this is absolutely beautiful. I, you, uh, you presented not just the whole story of Mexico, but it was just very thorough. And it came all the way through. And it was alive. Um, so Thank for you. anybody who hasn't, who wants to hear all of it again, maybe you've heard part of it and you want to hear the whole thing, this will be available on a podcast soon. It's the, the book is the, and the book when it comes out, the story of the Jews of Mexico. Um, it will, yeah, as I said, it'll be available on a podcast. This recording is on Darren Nister's Facebook and YouTube. Please follow Darren Nister on Facebook or YouTube, or on our website, darrenister.org, for more exciting presentations. But um, I want to uh, leave it off from here and uh, let you go and enjoy the rest of, your, of all of your days. Um, but thank you so much again, Josh, for this beautiful, beautiful introduction of your thank work you. to the world. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And so I'm going to stop sharing here and then I am going to stop recording and uh, I'm going to stop streaming very soon. I will figure out where it is. Uh oh. And stop streaming. Okay. <laughs>